everyone and welcome. Thank you so much for joining. We will go ahead and get started in just a bit. For now, though, I put a little icebreaker question in the chat. Where are you joining from and how do you pronounce GIF? Do you pronounce it with a hard G like I do, like GIF, or do you say GIF like the peanut butter? And yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, pass it over to our speakers to get us started on answering that question. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, I I think I'm I'm Team GIF. I think that's where I fall on that one. Yep, um, Team GIF, one hundred percent. Now we were talking about this right before the stream started uh, about you know the origins of what it stands for. Does the originator of GIF versus GIF <laughs> have a say in this anymore, or is it now you know up for public domain? We have so. decreed no. That he yeah. does not have a say anymore. Yeah, we, we it's out of his hands. Yeah. Um, let's see. <laughs> I'll read out a couple <laughs> and then we'll go ahead and get started seeing that. It is noon, uh, noon central time, but let's see. We've got um GIF, we've got hard G, hard G, um, and then we've got GIF like gift, um, yeah. hard G. It seems like a lot of hard G uh people in the room. Um, oh, we've got a soft G. All right. All right. So you know what? Good mix. And I appreciate both perspectives, um, but I'm definitely team GIF. So <laughs> all right, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to today's webinar, Top 5 Ways to Turn Searches into Sales, sponsored by Hawk Search by Bridgeline. My name is Rebecca Ackerman, and I'm the Webcast Production Coordinator here at the American Marketing Association. Before we start, I wanted to point out that there is a Q&A box you can put questions into for the live Q&A at the end. You can also participate and network in the chat box. There will also be a poll, so be on the lookout for that to open in a little bit. This session will be, will be recorded and available for on-demand viewing. You'll be receiving an email within 24 hours with the link to access this content on demand. Very excited to introduce you to our speakers, Jonathan Meyer, Senior Solutions Engineer at Hawk Search by Bridgeline, and Victoria Lindsay, Marketing Coordinator at Bridgeline. And with that, I'll pass it over to them. Excellent. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, hi, so um, let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, so Rebecca, thank you for that wonderful warm introduction there. Uh, with, I am uh, Jonathan Meyer here. Let's go ahead and get to the next slide. Uh, I'm Jonathan Meyer, a senior solutions engineer for Hawk Search by Bridgeline. I've been working in the search space for close to a decade. Been working with Hawk Search for about eight years now, so have lots of uh, information around the kind of site search and, and the functionality. Joined today uh, with my lovely co-presenter Victoria. Hello. Um, so I'm the uh, marketing coordinator uh, here at Bridgeline, and I feel like especially. You know, as this is with the um, AMA crowd here, I feel like I am the, the stand in marketer. I've been uh, <laughs> working in marketing and at ad agencies. Uh, I'm, I'm based here in Southern California. So I've, I've been doing that uh, here in SoCal for also about a decade. So uh, very excited to join you guys today. Victoria, you're the voice of the per the people on the line here. You're, you're going to represent them, speak of their pump thoughts, right? <laughs> I'll do what I can. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And, and just to, I guess, to, to answer the question, I'm from uh, the Chicagoland area. So for everyone wondering where everyone's from, you now know all of our locations. But let's go ahead and dive into it here. So um, one of the main things that we're going to really try and tackle here is, does your site architecture transform searchers? into buyers. That's kind of the, the primary thing that we really want to focus on here. We're going to cover lots of different topics around that and show you different ways to handle that. But one of the things that we want to make sure that you guys are aware of and that we can hopefully get, uh, you know, maybe focus a little bit more on what you guys might be interested in. Uh, we do have a poll question. Rebecca was kind enough to, to highlight that up there at the front. We want to really get that out there in front of you guys and, and try and give you some time to respond to that poll question. So that poll question, you should see it there on the side of your screen. Uh, what we're looking to understand, what we were looking to have you guys answer for us is which of the three categories are you most interested in improving? There's lots of different areas that you can improve a site on. We're talking about growing traffic, uh, increasing conversion rates, or increasing the average order value. Go ahead and select those responses. We'll go ahead and pull back in the uh, results from that in a few slides as we get a little bit further in here. But again, we're really just trying to understand, you know, what is important for, for you guys in the marketing space here, growing traffic, increasing conversion rates, or increasing that AOV. Let's go ahead and uh, dive a little bit further into this topic now, though. So really, again, what are you gonna be able to understand once we have wrapped up this, when we get to the end of this presentation, 
What are you going to be able to walk away with? Uh, hopefully, <laughs> all things going well, you're going to be able to break down your site into the key elements that drive conversion. We want you to be able to also direct traffic directly to the exactly right product for purchase, really get those people that you know are looking for products, searching for products, navigating the products. We want to get to those purchases very easily. And then identify new opportunities to raise the value of every order. There's lots of different tooling and different functionality that can help with that. We're going to be breaking all of that down and covering each end of that for you. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, but before we can really talk about, um, you know, uh, those three key takeaways that we want you to be able to walk away from this webinar with, um, I do want to talk about um, sort of that, um, the overall strategy, uh, you know, the traffic conversion, increasing AOB. Oh, uh, you have to talk about traffic first, uh, I think, because, you know, if you don't have traffic going to your site, uh, there won't be any conversions. There won't be any, you know, increasing that average order value. So, you know, we we do have to at least mention, you know, a good traffic strategy is, of course, important. Um, some just this is a very, you know, uh, overview, but um, that includes on-page SEO, off-page SEO good backlink strategy, good campaigns, getting people to your site. And then, um, you know, some helpful categories to think about a, a healthy traffic strategy. Um, I like to break it up into time, location, and persona. So what I mean by that is um, understanding what is the best time to send people to your site? Did you just have a big site overhaul recently? Is the architecture just, did you just revamp everything? Um, and the reason that's important is, you know, it does take a little bit of time for the dust to settle, for Google to index everything. Um, so you just want to make sure, you know, it's a good time to send uh, yeah, it's large like a large amount of You know, you don't want to have people over to your house after you're in the middle of a remodeling project. That's not creating exactly. a good impression there, right? Yeah, 100%. Um, and then just actually uh, sticking with that house analogy, uh, are you sending them to the right location? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if you're inviting a big crowd over, um, is it obvious where they should be going? Um, so creating an, uh, an intuitive flow of traffic. You know, if you have a campaign uh, that's launching and you're having them arrive at the about page of your site, but you ultimately want them to be in the category pages to help them purchase a product, you know, things like that. Just very intuitive decisions on the location you're sending your visitors. And then the last category is understanding your ideal persona. You know, that, that person that is um, visiting your site, uh, you know, using the example of say like a bookseller, um, what kind of books do you sell? Are they highly technical? Does that mean that the language you're using on your site is highly technical? And, and understanding the type of language of your ideal um, client or your ideal persona, making sure um, when they arrive, they're they're arriving in a place that feels very natural to them uh, with the language that you're using. Um, so that's, you know, in, in an ideal world, the, uh, the three categories to keep in mind for a, a good, healthy traffic strategy, uh, you know, along with the, you know, strong uh, SEO um, content that um, is Google friendly, you know, image loading time, keeping all of those things in mind um, to make sure that it's a, it's a healthy website, uh, according to Google. However, uh, this can all go wrong. <laughs> If you are getting people to your site and you're still seeing things like low engagement, low conversion, and ultimately lost revenue, um, that's where you need to look at, you know, you might have an amazing traffic strategy. You might understand your ideal persona, but if something's not connecting, that's where we're going to get into uh, a little bit of that conversion and AOB strategy. So I'm going to uh, pass it off to uh, Jonathan here, and he'll start kind of driving through what that can look like. Yeah, and really, what we're going to look at is once you know, once you've gotten them, that was wonderfully explained there. You know, the how you know using that traffic strategy to get someone to the site. That's where things can start to fall apart, and that's where I think some of the focus gets lost. Is everyone's focused so far up that funnel of you know we want, need to have good SEO, we need to get people to the site, but then once they get there, things start to fall apart. And there's really 
some very simple things that you can do, some really common functionalities and features that are out there from a site search perspective to help you increase those conversions, reach those AOV goals. Um, and you really want to guide them to the right results. You want to use the features and functionalities to guide those visitors to what they're looking for and understanding that user intent. User intent is going to be what we're really going to spend a lot of time focusing on because there are several different kinds of users who are going to come to the site, different roles that they're trying to fulfill. And we're going to walk through each one of those and really kind of break that down for you. But first, we want to understand those poll results questions. So we want to, you know, if you've taken the time to answer those, we're getting back in the results here. Looks like the majority of the response here is going to be increasing conversion rates. We All have right. a 55% result, uh, a selection for the increasing conversion rates, 45% said growing traffic, uh, and no one said increasing average order value. Well, uh, we'll definitely still tackle average order value because it is an important part. And, and really what we kind of look at this as is it's a um, it's a, a kind of a crawl, walk, run approach. You know, once you've solved for the growing traffic, uh, then you want to look at increasing conversion rates. And once you've solved for the increasing conversion rates, well, then you want to increase that average order value. And so it's important to still keep that in mind so that once you've kind of tackled that, well, now we've, you know, we've gotten our conversion rates, we're getting those rates up, we're, we're seeing that in improvement and uptick. Uh, we then want to go and say, well, we want to make that value even better when those people are converting. Yeah. Let's get a bigger dollar, dollar value attached to that. And I, I will say, I 100% understand why, you know, 45% of you say traffic, 55% say conversion. Essentially, that's describing, um, you know, the ingredients of the cake and the cake itself. And what I would like to say is increasing your AOV. It's the frosting. It's like you already have a cake and that's great. We can make it even better. <laughs> so that's, that's a little bit of my like pitch for why AOV is um, I, definitely a strategy that you don't want to leave behind because you don't want to have dry cake. <laughs> so that's, that's my pitch. <laughs> dry cake sounds terrible. Uh, so then how, so let's, let's talk about that, about how we can help with those, those goals. Uh, and really, I mentioned a little bit earlier, it's going to be, what we're really going to be focusing on is segmenting that user intent. Uh, you get lots of different people to the site. Once we've gone through that, that traffic growing process and leveraging that functionality to make sure, you know, following some of those traffic strategies that, that Victoria was bringing up for us. Uh, once they've arrived at the site, there's really kind of four uh, unique motivations. And really this, these kind of segmentations also apply to those, that bigger picture, that top of funnel, someone's in Google, they're going to be looking for an informational visitor. You're going to have a navigational visitor. You're going to have someone who's specifically looking for transactional. And of course, you're more focused on search. We're going to look at this, these kind of segmentations from the site search perspective, from the, once they've at, arrived at the site, how can you help support them? How can you break down uh, what their goals are, what their motivations are, what are the features and functionality that will support them. And we'll also provide some examples of uh, of sites that are doing these things very well or things that we can highlight so that you can get kind of a visual representation of uh, what you might want to be looking for to help improve your site. So let's talk about that first segmentation, informational. Who is an informational user? Uh, this gentleman here, he is on the hunt. He is looking for information. He is not uh, ready to purchase yet. He is looking to gather information around what he's looking to purchase. This is, these are the people who are really going to be looking for, uh, you know, they don't know necessarily what they're looking for. They might have an idea. They're going to be uh, trying to gather information around what are the different kinds of products that are out there, what are the different features that are out there. Uh, you know, the brands that are supported, they're going to be doing lots of research. Researchers, there's another way to, that you can commonly see this, uh, this kind of user segmentation described is this is a researcher, informational. This is someone who is really kind of the very beginning of that purchase process. Uh, and there's lots of different ways that we can break that down a bit further. Victoria, though, I think you do a really great job of explaining uh, the common habits and, and some of the opportunities that are available here. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, very common things that you would see an informational user doing. They're reading reviews, they're comparing products. Um, you know, one of the great opportunities is a, a chance for them to explore other user uploaded uh, photos of that mm -hmm. product or service, you know, out in the world. That might, you might think of like a Yelp sort of scenario, but, you know, oftentimes there could be um, uh, piped into a website 
examples from Instagram. Someone's tagged this product and now there's like a live feed showing on the website itself what this product looks like out in the world. Um, so this really is an opportunity for a brand to um, just use this as a chance to be as transparent about their product as possible. Showing it out in the world really gives you a chance to, you know, show uh, that consumers can trust this product because like, look, you're not even trying to put any sort of veneer on it. You're just allowing people to access um, reviews and photos directly for themselves to see it for themselves and essentially letting um, other uh, users of that product be your brand advocates. Um, so that's, you know, a, a really huge opportunity for brands to, um, to use this informational um, visitor uh, to their benefit. And then um, really your, your goal is to try and um, use this as an opportunity to guide the informational user um, through their experience. So just making it as easy uh, as possible for them to find what they are looking for. So a couple of ways that that can um, look for your site. Uh, so here's just a couple of examples before um, we have Jonathan actually show you, you know, on, on a live web website. Um, but, you know, it could be anything from, again, showing the, um, the comparing products feature is like a really helpful a website widget to have um, showing, you know, oh, if you're typing in a pot, having a really, um, you know, intuitive uh, examples of like, oh, what, what products did you mean? Pot can mean a pot with a lid for cooking versus a plant pot for gardening. Like, let me help you, you know, clarify what you're looking for. So, you know, again, this, this user is on the hunt and you just want to make it as easy as possible for them to find what they are looking for. So Jonathan's actually going to, uh, to jump into a, a couple of it, or write an example here of what that looks like. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I think is important to, to highlight here is that the the informational tools that you have available to you, uh, and Victoria, you were doing a really great job of explaining kind of what uh, separates that as a brand opportunity that it can help. That if you want to kind of present the unvarnished truth there to your, your visitors, to your users, your shoppers, your customers, um, it's a differentiator. Uh, you know, everyone's competing, you know, in, in, in your own kind of pools where, where you have your different, your, your industries. Um, you're always competing with Amazon as well. One of the ways that you can set yourself apart is to provide good information to those informational visitors. You become a trusted authority. You become a resource beyond just a commerce place. Uh, if I'm looking for information, let's say here we're looking at Apt, who is a, a consumer electronics, so washers, dryers, televisions, you know, audio equipment. Um, I might be going to them. I would go to them first to do research, to look for information around. If I'm looking to buy like a television, um, using that data points to also drive comparisons. So we're going to walk through some real quick examples here on Apt uh, of kind of, you know, good practices of, of what you might want to strive for to help meet the needs of an informational user. So as an example, we'll jump up to the search box here. As Victoria mentioned, of course, that autocomplete is going to be very important to help guide that visitor towards what they're looking for to make sure that they are getting towards that information as quickly as possible. So if I say I'm looking for a 4K television, you can see that this is, of course, starting to generate an autocomplete and make those suggestions for uh, what we're looking for here. Now, as I've gone ahead and typed this in, let's go ahead and back this up a little bit here. You can actually see that uh, when we're doing this here, we're getting back in multiple suggestions here. We're getting back in articles. We're getting back in product guides. We're getting in search suggestions. And so let's say that uh, I'm just looking for a 4K television as a category. I know this is what I'm looking for. I don't wanna, I'm not looking for any of these other items here. Again, the autocomplete guides us through this process, makes suggestions for searches, categories, articles, and guides. Again, as an informational user, this is important information to present to us that we are seeing uh, what searches other visitors have been searching on, what categories are available, what content is available, as of course, the products themselves. This is guiding that informational visitor towards what they're looking for, because again, they're doing that research. So I might say, you know what, I'm actually looking for that category. I want to see everything that's available. Now that we're at the category level, and we're going to walk through a couple other examples, because some of these do have that overlap here. But the thing to highlight when we're talking about an informational user and what they're going to be getting information out of is when we're on an experience like this, you can notice that they're presenting other options here. This isn't just a product listing page of all of the uh, 4K televisions that are available here. We're presenting 
the products as well as information on one of the best TVs, a buying guides, uh, several different buying guides I should actually highlight. We're also presenting multiple different facets and filters to let the visitors see what's available. The screen sizes are going to be important, things like that. But really what I want to highlight here, I'm sorry, Victoria, did you have something? Oh, no, no, you're good. Excellent. I'm sorry. I thought I heard you say that. <laughs> I thought I heard you there. I didn't want to, uh, I have a tendency to ramble on. No, you're, <laughs> so you're doing great. <laughs> let's go ahead. And what I really want to highlight there, one of the key things from a, a site search perspective, beyond having that autocomplete, beyond having the good facets and filters and beyond presenting even rich content like this outside of the navigation choices is a product comparison. Take advantage of all that information that you have around your product catalog to let a visitor very easily compare products using that data. So we have an LG here, we have a Samsung, we have uh, another kind of Samsung. Let me make, ahead, make those selections there. You can notice this is also front and center. This is above the product image. This is letting you know that comparison is a part of the experience here, calls attention to it very clearly. One of the things that, that we can talk about from a feature perspective is all the different tools that you might want to have available to you. But a part of this is always going to be UI. How important are you expressing this is and how easy are letting your visitor know that this is functionality that's available. So we've gone ahead and added these to compare. We'll go ahead and click this compare functionality here. This will then take us into a product comparison screen where we're then able to see very easily side by side what are the differences between these products. Uh, for example, the LG that we highlighted here has a direct type of backlight. The Samsungs do apparently not. However, all of them do support dynamic range. So as an informational visitor, someone who is looking to gather research resources to understand what's available before I make my purchase process, having functionality like this, those buying guides, having re relevant content, providing uh, facets and filters that a visitor can see what are the options that are available to me. But really the comparison feature is the one that I would say, if you're looking to do anything in this space to really meet the needs of an informational user, this is gonna be one of the key ones to really let them see what is available as a difference between these products. Maybe it's very important to me that uh, Alexa is a part of the virtual assistants for this. This makes it very easy for me to highlight several different items, put those into a product comparison and to see side by side what is available for those. Let's go ahead and get back into the deck though here. Let's show you a little bit more and move on to the next segment that we're gonna talk about. So what is that next segment? It's gonna be the searchers. Victoria, what do we know about the searchers? Man, searchers, uh, they know what they want. So <laughs> it's a little bit different than what we were talking about with the informational uh, user. Uh, the searcher is, um, if we had to pick an analogy, because there's going to be just a smattering of analogies this is how <laughs> <laughs> um we could call this searcher the spear fitcher so it's just you know they have uh their site set on something very specific they know what they want to get out of this um this search and uh they just want to get in and get out and they know what they're looking for um so this could be um you know content it could be a product it could be a download they are not interested in casual br uh, browsing so, you know, if if we had to put this in real terms, um, this is not the friend that you take uh, window shopping. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this is not the person that you want to go thrifting with or antiquing like they just they want one thing they're in they're out and it's an incredibly efficient experience. <laughs> um, so as far as uh, common habits of the uh, searching user, they go directly to the search bar. So that is going to be a really key piece of your site architecture is making sure it's obvious where that is. Um, and you really, um, you know, the, as far as brand opportunities, uh, this is uh, the time to streamline the process. And even though they might not be interested in browsing, um, they may be interested in other products associated with what they're there for. So you sort of take uh, holding with a loose grasp the idea that they are there for one thing. It's sort of like the person that, you know, you, you go to a grocery store, like I'm only here for hot dogs, just forgetting that you might need buns, you know? So making sure that like, if they're shopping for hot dogs, maybe the complimentary products like ketchup and mustard and buns are nearby, uh, just in case, you know, you're not, you just want to make sure that if they need it, it's there for them. Um, so again, using uh, just a, a lot of analogies in many different directions. <laughs> They're always food-based. We need to stop doing that during the lunch hour because cakes, it's hot dogs. I know. 
<laughs> but uh, but driving into the um, the different tools to assist this user. Um, so this could be, you know, the different facets and filters. Uh, it can be giving relevant results, intuitive categories, autocomplete. There's just so many different tools that can really uh, streamline the process for a searching user. Um, you know, a couple of the ones up on the examples. I mean, it's, uh, I think the yellow handbags is a great one because, you know, you might specifically know that you need a yellow handbag. And so making that as easy as possible uh, for that user, especially when it comes to price, uh, style, just, just giving as many relevant results uh, as you can to really streamline that process. Um, I think the, the tires is also really helpful because there are so many different facets and features that can go into automotive parts. And so making it as easy as possible to, you know, get to exactly what they're looking for. Um, and so then we're also, you know, once again, we're going to have Jonathan walk through uh, this in a, a real life example out there in the, yeah. in the internet. And for this, we're going to go ahead and jump over to Soul Trader. So as a, as, you know, Victoria, again, great job uh, summarizing what a searcher is doing. It really is someone who knows exactly what they're looking for, but exactly can sometimes be uh, <laughs> a relative term. Uh, you know, in this case here on Soul Trader, we're going to walk through a couple of different quick examples to highlight what we mean by that. And so Soul Trader, they're a footwear company out in the UK. And so something that a visitor might search for on their site, I'm going to jump into the search box here. And I might say that I'm looking for, you know, Vans trainers. And, you know, again, nice autocomplete presenting information, letting a visitor see kind of what they're going to, to look for there. I'm going to go ahead and pull back in those results here. Obviously, you know, we're seeing the search results for that. This is, this is an example of someone who knows exactly what they're looking for. In this case, they're looking for Vans trainers. But commonly, one of the things that you want to make sure that you're then supporting for these kind of more broad exact searches is good faceting and filtering. The ability for someone to say, oh, you know, I didn't, I didn't think to put in that I was specifically looking for a men's shoes. Oh, I didn't think, you know, I really was looking for those high top trainers. And oh, you know what, really, I, I need a pair of blue shoes. You know, you're, these are the facets and filters that you want to have available so that when someone does that search, when they say, this is what I'm looking for, they're expressing their intent to you. They're telling you what they're looking for. They're using exact terms, but you want to make sure that when they get back in those results, if they're not seeing exactly what they're looking for, but you were supposed to just kind of intuit out of a search for uh, Vans shoes or Vans trainers, uh, that you want to have the facets and filters to a visitor navigate and make those refinements. The flip side of that, though, is that you need to be able to also support when someone knows exactly and in the more stricter terms of that, what that exact search is. So being able to then also say, if I was to jump up to the search box and say, you know what, I'm looking for a uh, men's vans, high top trainers in blue. And we're going to go ahead and have the same results. So if someone does that keyword search, they can get right to the product as well. Again, streamline that process. A searcher knows exactly what they're looking for. So if they're going to give you that intent, make sure that you're able to get back in the right results and provide the facets and filters so that they can navigate through that experience. But if they're able to give you those longer tail keyword searches, that contain a lot of those same values that normally would have in a faster filter, make sure you're able to get them to that product all that much quicker by having that search box show that example and also be able to tie directly into the product detail page. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, I mean, this does bring us to uh, the next category. Uh, if, if you had in the grand scheme of the four different categories of user intents that we are covering, uh, I would say the polar opposites would be the difference between the searching user, who's the spear fisher, who's going in for one thing, wants to get out easily, not browsing or casually, you know, searching. Um, the difference between that on the opposite side of the scale would be the navigational user. So that one here, this user needs a little bit of guidance. So this is the person that, again, going back to my, the person that you take shopping, uh, this is the one that maybe does need to do some window shopping. This person is a great option for antiquing and thrifting. <laughs> like they don't mind the hunt. They're there just casually seeing, seeing what's available, what's in season, what's, you know, um, they might have a category of what they're looking for. Um, but they need a little bit of guidance. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more um, about that. But I would say that the common user 
um, uh, sorry, the common habits of the navigational user are, um, you know, things like using category pages and relying on on-site recommendations. Um, so this, this is the type of user that would do incredibly well with, you know, um, a personal shopper coming up to them, and, you know, asking like, how can I help you? You know, what are you looking for today? Uh, because we're talking about more e-commerce um, versions of that. This is, you know, like a, a pop-up that can ask like, how can I help you? Or, you know, uh, suggested um, uh, things on the site itself. So uh, brand opportunities, uh, again, this user is open to suggestions and they need it. Um, this is also a chance for you to curate some options that spark ideas, that spark some inspiration. Um, and, you know, the ways to do that is just making the, the filters, the facets, those different variations um, easy to navigate and easy to find. Uh, so some different ways of doing that, the, the different tools that we can um, use to assist this user. Um, so we do have some examples here of, you know, the um, autocomplete, you type in speaker and you can show uh, a few different um, categories of you know, popular searches, recommended products, top product categories within speaker. All they knew is they were coming to the site for a speaker and really from there you can kind of guide them along and, and let that um, search bar be your personal shopper that's asking, how can I help you? <laughs> and then uh, that, that's my personal shopper voice. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, auto, auto completes a really helpful um, example of that. And then also just using the, the two foot metal stool example, you know, that's a little bit more specific of an example. That's someone coming in and saying like, oh, I, I need a very you know, specific kind of stool. Um, and then you're giving them some options of saying, oh, do you need metal? Do you need it this height? And kind of um, guiding them along in that way as well. Um, so we're going to uh, have Jonathan walk through some different category structures and pages that show this out in the real world. Yeah, and, and to accomplish that, I wanted to, to give a different feel here. We, we've covered some very kind of very commerce focused examples, apt being consumer electronics, Soul Trader being very, you know, shoes. I mean, you can't get more consumer than that. Uh, but one of the things that I do want to make sure that we're also highlighting here is that these kinds of ideas, when we're talking about the 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 uh, informational visitor, the searcher, and the navigational, these also apply to the B two B experience. And this is usually a little bit more uh, heavy in terms of like the complexity. And so I thought this would be a really good example to highlight some of the navigational functions from a B2B experience, because they've got a lot of different things that they need to consider when you're thinking about a B2B catalog. So here we're looking at Allied Electronics, who really has a very complex catalog. They are an electronics, uh, supplier here. So we've got things like, you know, different tools and hardwares and switches and relays and sensors and wires and just a very complex catalog. And so one of the things that you want to make sure in a B2B environment, when we start thinking about this from a navigation, well, this of course also applies to e-commerce, but just kind of provide the example all the way on the other end of the, the spectrum here of like the most complex example that you could get of a navigational uh, experience would be something like Allied here, where I might say that I'm looking for sensors. And, and you know, if I'm not going to go for the search box here, maybe I'm going to use the navigation option. So having those clean categories front and center, another way to help the visitor understand what's available on your site here. Uh, we're going to say that we're looking for sensors. This will take us a little bit further into the experience where now uh, sensors is a broad category for someone like Allied Electronics. So we're seeing, you know, suggestions for featured brands. There's a little bit of rich text up here at the top for some SEO. So I'm going to loop that back around to the, the, uh, the uh, you know, the top of the funnel experience here. I have that good traffic strategy exactly, there. Exactly, so yes. That is important. <laughs> Uh, but once you're on this page, you're now we're, we're a little bit further into the experience. You know, maybe I'm looking for uh, encoders. I'm, I'm not even sure what an encoder sensor is, but in the B2B space, there's a lot of them. So you can see that once we've navigated to this page, again, we're providing the kind of experience of uh, that category structure. We know the top level category, we're doing that subcategory. It's cleanly defined in terms of another op number of options that are available. Got that visual representation of what that subcategory is as well, so suggesting the brands like we saw there. Now that we're here on the subcategory here, so we're on the sensors and encoders page here, you can see that obviously we're pulling back in the relevant information here for that, that category. There's some detailed information in terms of the actual product. So again, letting that navigational visitor understand what's available. 
uh, you know, the, the, the way to think of a lot of this, and you're, you're noticing that there's probably some overlap in terms of what we're talking about here, it's understanding that user's intent. If I was an informational visitor here, if I was looking for that research, again, I've got that product comparison that's listed here. But if I'm a navigational visitor, I might leverage that product comparison, but really I'm gonna be trying to break down what is available here. I've navigated to the particular category. Again, having those facets and filters available is gonna be important to be able to let a visitor make those selections. But one of the key things that I would highlight, especially when we start thinking about this from the B2B experience, and again, that complexity that we see there is not just limiting the number of options that are available. So for something like this, if we go into the advanced filtering, so having this as an option for a navigational visitor, this is meeting their specific needs. It's not just, oh, you're kind of standard, you know, maybe this is more search focused examples of what's commonly being used, uh, understanding what facets and filters are commonly being used to then say, here are the ones that we wanna make sure are being presented front of, you know, on the top of the experience, but letting those navigational visitors have a more advanced experience and calling attention to that. That's right there on the side of the page. After the rest of the more common navigation options, we can click that advanced option. This then breaks it down very, you know, very visually here. We've got a lot of different options that are being returned here. Supply voltage, special features, series, shaft size, termination, just a bunch of different options. And again, you want to make sure that when you're presenting this kind of diverse set of facets and filters, that you're again making it still very easy. Just because we're uh, trying to support a navigational experience does not mean that we then need to leave them in the weeds of uh, facets and filters. So as an example here, if we're making a selection to say, oh, you know, I'm looking specifically for a servo mount uh, sensor encoder. When I'm making that selection, you'll notice that options like the different manufacturers are now being zeroed out where something like Dynapar still becomes available. If I make a selection for Dynapar, that then goes ahead and updates the other options that are available here. So these facets and filters are being more dynamically generated, uh, understanding as I'm making these selections, letting the visitor continually make those selections further and further in, so that then I can say, you know what, uh, show me the 33 results then for the selections that I've made, really supports that navigational visitor. You've made those selections, you've shown them all the options that are available, you've helped them navigate through that as they're making these individual selections, values are being removed and guiding them towards the only relevant options that match what they're looking for. Then being able to then get into those filtered results. And again, now I can maybe I can make suggestions for comparisons or sorting options and so on. But really does kind of support the more heavy lifting that we see in the navigational tools uh, experience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but ultimately, so, you know, we, <laughs> we have ultimately the, the big goal of this is whether you're an informational user, whether you're a searching user, whether you're a navigational user, all of our, our goals is to try and get to this transaction. Uh, so this is um, the, the fourth and kind of, kind of the most important of the four categories is the transactional user. Um, so this is the user that wants to buy. Now they may have started as informational, search or navigational, um, but ultimately, you know, you've done a great job. You have guided them through the journey. They found what they needed. They've added to cart. And so now this is the user that um, is ready to make a purchase. Um, so the brand opportunity, and I, I'm not going to cover, you know, what are the common habits of this user? Because um, the common habit is they've added to cart. <laughs> so that's, that's where they are. Um, and so now we have some uh, opportunities to essentially um, get that frosting on the cake. So the cake is already here. They've already added to cart. That, that's what we want. But do not think that the opportunities have stopped um, because this is where things like uh, you know increasing that average order value. And essentially, this is the time that you can really create some brand loyalty uh, for the long term. Um, this is really where that opportunity presents itself. Um, so that could be with things like cross-selling, upselling, suggested complementary accessories, um, you know, like I said in the example of hot dogs, maybe have um, ketchup, mustard, and buns nearby, you know, th things like that, um, making it as user-friendly an experience as possible in that transaction space. And so uh, we also do want to mention that this is definitely a, a great time to uh, consider things like loyalty programs, um, and then also specifically for the B2B sector, um, making it really easy for that user to come back and do another um, uh, order. So doing a sort of reorder pad. 
Um, so, uh, you know, what that can look like uh, is things like I said, you know, doing recommendations, spotlighting, we'll get to see that, you know, in a real life example in a second, um, abandoned part messaging. Um, I know, well, when the pandemic started and everyone started online shopping, like there was no tomorrow. Um, I may have been one of those people. Um, I had like a real practice of, you know, I'll just keep adding to cart and I'll think about it later. And then there's a, a handful of email uh, campaigns or pop-ups that would, you know, say like, hey, we noticed that this is in your cart. Have you thought about looking at that again? Or can we suggest these other items to go in the cart? Or did you know that we only allow, you know, our our top rated products uh, to stay in the cart for an hour. Do you want to look at your cart again? Like there was all these like little, you know, different brands did it differently, but there was, um, it was an opportunity for increased communication where it'd be like, oh yeah, I forgot I added that to the cart. Let me look at that again. Or, um, you know, there's a, a coupon presented uh, or a loyalty program I could sign up for to really help get me through that transaction process. Um, but all of those uh, pieces of communication happened when I had already added to cart. So it was definitely, you know, the, the communication didn't stop just because I added to cart. It was really still an opportunity for some, some brand outreach there. Um, so, you know, just showing here the, the thanks for your order, you've already placed your order. And then they can also, you know, do some pop-up and spotlighting of shopping our, our best sellers. Um, you know, in the top right there, we have uh, an example of what a reorder pad could look like. Uh, so, and I, uh, I know we're gonna give some examples here of what that looks like out in the world itself as well. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna let you drive a little bit here, yeah. uh, Victoria. So, <laughs> so, so welcome to my shopping experience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it is, you know, July of 2020, and here I am on West Elm, uh, and I am going to let's see, I am looking to redo my bathroom. So we're gonna go. I'm gonna check out some different vanity options. I like the one on the the left. That looks great. That's the size I'm looking for beautiful finish. Uh, I'll go ahead and click. Uh, yeah, that one looks perfect. I think it's great ship to home. And so even in this form right here, before I even have a chance to add to cart, I can go ahead and see the complimentary products. Um, so I, you know, can look at that and say, uh, you know, I'm going to unselect. I don't need a sink. I don't need uh, those accessories, but I do need a mirror. I need a mirror above that vanity. All right. So let's add these two products to cart. Super streamlined experience. Now I'm already in my cart and I still have more suggestions. Again, this is more chances of communication with the user. And these are other, again, complimentary products. Uh, this could be other things with a similar style or just other home goods that West Elm thinks I might like. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and go through the checkout process at this point. Now from here, um, I love the uh, addition of, you know, the, the home delivery um, and just kind of doing even more breaking it down in other uh, complimentary products. So that, that's a really uh, a good example of, I'm a transactional user, I'm ready to give you my credit card number, but you're just making sure I'm not forgetting anything and low key suggesting other things within the same world of what I've already let you know I'm here for. And Victoria, I think this is also a, a good kind of transition because they're also calling attention to one of the other things you mentioned, the loyalty program here. Uh, on this checkout screen, they're talking about, you know, yeah. earn 10% back in rewards. Rewards are a big portion of that. And I think, we uh, also want to touch on Old Navy as a little bit of an example. Of that. Yeah, yeah. And Old Navy, you know, I know we mentioned um, that the uh, transactional user, they've already added to cart, and that's a great chance for you to mention uh, loyalty programs. Um, Old Navy, I don't know, maybe you've seen their advertising. They tend to be a little bit high energy and to let you know right away everything that is going on so you go to their site and that is the first thing that they are letting you know like hey we got a loyalty program you're gonna want in on this before you even get into our site um so they do make it very clear up front and then there's always you know headers up top 
Uh, there's still even a little uh, pop up on towards the bottom of the screen. So they really want you to know, like, we have a program, it's probably going to add some value to your shopping experience. So they actually do that at the very beginning, uh, regardless of user intent, they want you to know <laughs> that like, hey, you're probably here to spend some money and we're going to make it easy on you um, and have a, a program for you to, um, to take part in. So that's, again, um, those are just some examples that I don't know, may have come from my own personal experience. <laughs> so, so we know what your bathroom looks like and we know what you're wearing. Exactly. <laughs> What's in your closet, I should say. There we go. <laughs> well, we, we couldn't get more opposite in terms of uh, the busyness versus the sedate than going over to someone like MRC Global, who uh, has a lot of options here, but this is really direct and to the point, not very flashy at all. But this is an example of the, the flip side of that. You mentioned in the, uh, the examples that you went through, you know, reordering pads when we start thinking about you know what can we do to help increase average order values and really drive that transactional visitor uh in a b2b environment it's going to be those you know very commonly in this space it's going to be people who are coming back in and they're reordering the same thing that they've ordered for the last six months because they're basically just restocking they're getting the same gaskets and pipes and, and nuts and bolts and things like that so here's an example of someone like mrc global who has several different ways to completely uh, streamline that process. There's a quick order form where you can very quickly drop in uh, item numbers, put in the quantity and get those added to cart. It would show any order history uh, so I can really quickly view any orders that I did have open. And of course, do like requisitions or, or reorder things all from this first home screen where you're logging in. So uh, kind of the, 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 the inverse of what you see in the common commerce example of, you know, presenting these options at the checkout screen for a B2B environment, you are typically are aware of already who is on the site. There's typically a login process, uh, you know, right here. Hello, Jonathan, um, calling attention to who this visitor is. You can take advantage of that experience and really drill into that and prevent a, present a very kind of focused, hey, let's get to that transactional stage very quickly, which is why we wanted to break that down into its own user segment, because it really is kind of the, the, the culmination of the whole experience. Absolutely. And I, um, I did see, you know, I, I know, Q and A time is just right around the corner, but I have seen a couple of questions pop up about um, strategies around. You know, I know we've talked a lot about products, mm -hmm. but I do think it is helpful to mention. You know, products are not the only um, element that we're talking about in this e-commerce um, landscape. So there are, you know, there's content. Um, you know, if if you're going to a news site to find mm -hmm. articles or a research heavy site to find something that a specific author has written. Um, the facets and filters, autocomplete and categories, those are all still hugely important, especially if you are, you know, if you're a research assistant or a college student and you need to source one specific article, it's going to be so helpful if those facets and filters pop up like, here's really popular searches or here's other, you know, a, a great example is um, Audible, you know, here's other books by this author or here's um, books within the category that you have been previously searching or you just finished a book. Um, have you considered these other titles within the same, uh, you know, realm? So those are just examples because I know uh, I have a tendency to talk a lot about my, um, you know, online shopping and redecoration <laughs> um, world but um you know there are some really helpful um you know it's the same it's the same situation if you're dealing with content or also with services you know mm -hmm. um if you go to a site like thumbtack or um task rabbit you know they're going to ask you okay like are you looking for home services are you looking for cleaning cooking um if you're within those realms um here's some suggested uh subcategories you may not have even thought of um so it's even though we are talking a lot about products um in the b2c category it's just as helpful guiding someone through the experience if it's a service or if you're dealing with content on your site so i do want to at least mention that because i know i have a yeah no about. I it's, it's important to keep that in mind that the, the segments that we're talking about, and you know, we've kind of, again, like you said, primarily been talking about these from a commerce perspective, but those segments are the same kind of segments that, that apply to content. You're going to have the informational visitors 
uh, for your content experiences where, again, I'm just kind of doing some research. I'm figuring out what's available. You're going to have the searchers who know exactly what they're looking for. They're going to come to that site and they're going to tell you, you know, I'm looking for this article from this author published at this date. And you want to be able to support that. Uh, the navigational, which is, I think, probably maybe a little bit more common in that content space where you're going to be going more category browsing and so on and so forth. The transactional piece, though, even though, again, that has you know, that's a commerce kind of in connotation. It really is, are you delivering on that? Are they finding the content? Are they setting up that appointment? Are they downloading that document? Are they, you know, uh, scheduling that event? Whatever kind of that, that conversion point is for you is still the end goal. And you can still leverage things like, hey, we know that you've been here before, you've attended this event, so let's show you other events or, you know, very similar kind of ideas. All of the functionality we're talking about, those segmentations really do apply universally. It is when someone is on the site, who is on your site? And what is the goal they're trying to accomplish? So, you know, uh, how do you know that you're meeting those goals, though? Uh, that's the last piece that we're going to talk about here, the reporting and analytics. Uh, Victoria, what do we always say? <laughs> Which I perpetually am getting backwards. Data is the new oil. Data is like the that. new Data oil. is the new oil. There we go. <laughs> so what do we mean by that? We mean that really it is it is the lifeblood. It is the 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 way that you understand what is happening with your visitors. Are you delivering on what they're looking for? So the reporting analytics are really going to be the way that help you understand that and really help you know that you have it's the lifeblood of your site. If we're talking about all these different segmentations, we're talking about trying to grow traffic, increase uh, conversions, increase average order value. How do you know that you're meeting those goals beyond just kind of you know, looking at the dollar signs? How can you know where you need to be looking and focus on and paying your attention uh, when you do have the time to look at the tooling and functionality you have available? It's going to be through the reporting and analytics. Uh, they give you the ability to test different strategies. So, you know, hey, maybe this isn't working. Let's try a different strategy. Let's run both in concurrence, do some A-B testing and highlight use cases where you want to be able to clean your data. We're talking about all those different use cases where we're doing product comparisons. Well, if you don't have good data, that's a good way that you can very quickly discover that is that reporting analytics will show that, hey, people are engaging with our comparisons and they're not doing anything with it because they're not finding the information that they need to make those informed decisions. Uh, the regular reporting, it just really helps you understand kind of day in and day out what's actually happening on your site. What are your visitors actually doing? It can give you a bunch of different insights into uh, where you might want to be paying attention to. So what do we mean when we start thinking about reporting analytics? What are some specific reports that you want to be looking at? Uh, really, there's a few that we want to highlight here. Uh, you want to understand redirect. So something that is very commonly used in both content and in commerce is the idea of if someone does a keyword search and they know specifically what they're looking for uh, as a category level, that example that we first did on apt where I said I was looking for a 4K television, that might be a better use case to redirect from a search experience to redirect that towards the category page. Some reporting and analytics can help you understand that searches without clicks, your top 250 facets. There's a number of reports that we do want to highlight uh, that you should be paying attention to, searches with poor results. A good example of, uh, you know, when someone does a search on your site, are they getting back in zero results? Are they getting back in less than five results? What are those searches look like? What are the things that they are searching for? That reporting will let you understand that. You know, are you not carrying a brand name that your visitors might be looking for? You're not carrying an author that they're expecting to find. Uh, of course, conversion tracking being important as well lets you know, again, where are we meeting the needs of that transactional visitor? Spelling suggestions, is there data that we might need to be correcting for? And just kind of understanding your overall top 250 search keywords. To that end, though, we're going to get into an actual uh, kind of, uh, we'll get a little bit further into an actual example here. So we're going to go into our tool example. And when we start thinking about the tools that we can touch on, of course, uh, one of the things that everyone should be aware of is having access to something like Google Analytics. You might be using Core Metrics, Microsoft Power BI. There are a number of tools that have reporting and analytics available. You should definitely be taking advantage of those. But we do wanna, of course, give you a little bit of an insight into actually Hawk Search because we believe that we have really good reporting and analytics. Uh, there is a whole reporting section here uh, that we can dive into. We wanna make sure that we're giving a kind of high level reporting when you're first logging in. So again, that idea of, we know everyone always has lots of <laughs> hats that they're wearing uh, on the marketing team, you might be, you know, wearing multiple different hats. And so when you put that search hat on, what are we going to be able to get the information out of you want to be able to uh, take advantage of kind of high level snapshot reporting when you're first logging in here, seeing things like, well, what are my top 10 keyword searches? What does that kind of conversion or activity funnel look like? Uh, what are the facets and filters that we're talking about and that we're using? We've been showing lots of examples of how important facets and filters are to support the needs of both your informational visitors, to support the needs of your searchers, to support the needs of your navigational visitors. 
well, what are the ones that they're actually using? Are there deficiencies that are there? A report like this can help you highlight that information and understand those use cases. Let me actually go ahead and jump into the full reporting suite here. And because we've just been chatting for so long, let me go ahead and log into our demonstration environment. I got kicked out of my demo here. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> it's a security thing. It's so that, you know, if I was to wander away, Victoria, you couldn't come up to my computer and start. <laughs> yes. Uh, but I've logged back in. Now we're looking at the reporting section here. And again, let's take a look at something like uh, one that I think is super important to understand. Obviously, you can see just kind of ha having access to a lot of reporting that can give you insights into what's happening is important. Uh, I can let you focus in on the different areas. But one that I do want to highlight that I think is important for people to understand is something like searches without clicks. I mentioned this in, in passing on the slide deck, but in a real world example here, this is a report that'll let you understand what are the searches that visitors are doing on your site that they're then not interacting with the results. Uh, of course, any kind of reporting analytics tool, you should be able to change kind of what date range you're looking at. Since we're looking at our demonstration, I'm going to go ahead and blow this out to be over the last year. And you know what? We also want to make sure that we're providing for the different use cases. You know, if you're talking B2B, you're talking B2C, you're talking content. What's important to you might be different from another uh, kind of industry, another business. So we want to make sure that when we're looking at the reporting, that it's focused on what your specific concerns are. In this example here, we're going to say, well, show me any search that happened over the last year where the search was executed and no clicks were happening. But I could also say, show me any search that happened where there was less than five, less than 10, less than 20 clicks to get those insights into those examples where someone might've done a search and we only had a few interactions out of them. But we'll go ahead and refresh this. We'll pull back in our updated information. We can see, uh, of course, the total number of searches over the last year. Again, keeping in mind, this is our demonstration environment that have happened uh, with zero clicks. So then we're gonna break that down in terms of more detailed information, showing you those keywords showing you those uh, searches with zero clicks. Of course, these are all zero because of the way we configured the report and then highlighting the number of searches. So now we're breaking it down even further saying, well, there was 679 searches that we saw that were there was zero clicks, but now here are the search terms and here are the number of searches that have happened for that term. So in this example here, 329 times people have searched for the term hiking shoe and didn't interact with those results. This is a really clear example of a search that you might wanna then understand what's going on there? Are we not presenting the right information for that visitor? Are we do not have the right facets and filters? And in the use case of Hawk Search, we do want to make this a little bit easier. I can select the term from this report. That'll take us to our preview functionality where we can then see what that experience actually looks like. Are there marketing and merchandising efforts that are happening? What are our facets and filters looking like? So we can really kind of troubleshoot that experience. So really having good reporting analytics can help you kind of deliver on that experience, making sure that you're meeting the different user segment goals. But with all of that said, uh, I do know we've been seeing several questions be uh, entered into the chat here, and we want to make sure that we are leaving some time to help answer those. I know we only have a few minutes left here, uh, so we will go ahead and kind of move through as few as many of these, I should say, not as few, the opposite of as few of these as we can uh, tackle. So let's start with uh, one that we got here uh, towards the beginning of the conversation here. And, and Victoria, I think you already kind of helped answer uh, this one a little bit where we had the differences, uh, our thoughts on the differences between converting visitors, selling services uh, versus selling products. I thought you did a wonderful job tackling that. We do appreciate that question being submitted. Um, there are, so then one of the other questions that we got here was, are there any add-on costs for website building if those functions such as autofill, on-site suggestions, and product comparisons are added? How much will they be? Cost is really kind of a, a flexible uh, point. It depends on what features are you looking for? Uh, some of their, there are options that are out there that are free. Hawk Search is, is not one of them, um, but there are options out there. If you're just looking to get an autocomplete on your site, uh, that can be something that can be acquired uh, relatively cheaply. Uh, there can be then development efforts. It's really kind of a whole conversation that we need to have. Uh, and we're happy to have that conversation. Uh, you know, everything that we're showing you here today, the different features and functionalities that were being called out are things that Hawk Search does support or that we can help support uh, our clients with. So Lots of different things that we can help tackle there. Definitely, if you're interested, please reach out to us. We can provide a tailored demonstration for you, showing you those features and functionalities in both B2B, uh, B2C, and of course, content and enterprise searching. Absolutely. Um, we did tackle a little bit about uh, as any specific advice for B2B versus e-com as well. Really, B2B is typically just a more complex beast. Um, there is usually a lot of product attributes that we have to deal with. There's usually more complex searches that are happening. Uh, usually your visitors are logged in, there might be custom pricing, there's usually warehouse availability, there's lots of complexities that we usually see for B2B uh, as a main concern and really being able to support those use cases, be able to support, you know, uh, 
I'm shopping for uh, a product in a specific warehouse and that warehouse might have different availability, different contracts negotiated so that it doesn't carry certain brands, uh, being able to support those use cases, making sure that regardless of what kind of visitor is on the site. So if I'm an informational visitor and I'm looking to understand what does this site support, what does this warehouse actually carry, it can be honored by that individual uh, warehouse. Um, one of the other questions that we received here is any advice for buying a service? Um, this, I, 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 Victoria, I'm not sure maybe you have more insight into this. I'm not quite sure on what that question is necessary. Yeah, I, there. I think um, that that may have been covered because I saw that pop up a few times. So I did want to address that earlier. You know, is the strategy different for buying a product versus hiring for a service. And ultimately you're going to be using different categories. You're not going to be talking about, is it a 4K television versus some other television you're gonna be talking about? You know, is it house cleaning and how far do you want it from your location? Um, so different categories, but the same idea um, of having um, easy to navigate um, uh, architecture of your site mm -hmm. and then um, facets and filters that make sense for that service. You know, if it's house cleaning, um, you might not be doing an add to cart function, but you might be doing a book this cleaner function, or you might be uh, you know, if it's a site that has multiple cleaners to pick from, you might be looking up reviews of cleaners for, you know, past, um, from past clients, uh, things like that. So it's, um, even though we do keep saying add to cart uh, as part of a tra transactional um, sort of um, example, uh, in different sectors, add to cart is also download this content or um, check out this book or you know uh, book this photographer, something like that. Um, but actually there's, um, well, and I know we're right at, uh, at time, <laughs> but I uh, similar, um, I tried to cover this a little bit with my answer just there, but there was a question from an architecture firm that does custom homes. Um, their conversion would be an inquiry as opposed to a purchase. So it's the same thing um, throughout the architecture of your site. Um, a, having, um, you know, really good uh, SEO strategy, getting people to that site. But once they're there, if your ultimate goal is to um, convert them into that transactional user, making it as easy as possible for them to book that appointment mm -hmm. um, to get on the calendar, you know, even if it's in a blog that you've created to help your SEO score, um, make sure that that blog has a clear uh, CTA of, hey, check out this cool showcase that we did of a beautiful home. If you're interested in any of the elements that you've seen here, making it very easy for them to book that appointment to learn more about the service, or to go to a pricing page, just giving them all of the information they need at no point in their sort of user journey on your website should they wonder, what should I be doing now? So it's very intuitive if you're shopping, if you're online shopping, because I always know like my ultimate goal is to add to cart, mm -hmm. but it is a little bit different with services because if your ultimate goal is to get to someone to pick up the phone and give you a call and schedule an appointment, making it very easy for them to do that on your site, regardless of if they're in the about page, the blog, anywhere, they should be able to know, oh, I should just book an appointment and find out more information. So that, that's my little spiel, <laughs> but I know we're at time. So I, these have been really good questions. I, I really appreciated everyone's uh, thoughts here. Agreed. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan and Victoria for being here with us today. And also thank you to Hawk Search by Bridgeline for sponsoring. Thank you everyone for joining. I did have a last minute question come in asking what the best way to reach you two would be. Um, so if you wanted to say a little bit about that. I can put emails, <laughs> depending on what you're comfortable with, LinkedIn sure. pages. Um, Rebecca, remind me, are you sending out um, feedback or like, because we could also include, you know, our, our emails or a book a demo link or anything like that. Um, that would be, you know, the easiest way to, to find out more about Hawk Search and, and what we do at Bridgeline. Yeah, no um, I will. I do send out an email so we can include any of that information that I can get from you in a bit. And then that'll all be included in the email. So for everyone uh, wondering about that, that is your answer. 
And then as a reminder, this session is available on demand and you'll be, as I just said, receiving a link to the on-demand content within 24 hours in that full email, you'll have all of that uh, good information. I'd also like to draw your attention to our session survey feedback now available. I'm sorry, our session survey now available. We'd love to hear your feedback. Thank you everyone out there for joining us and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Great, thank you everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Rebecca.